Hey everybody, welcome back to James Bond Revisited, and this week we're going to take a look back at the follow-up to the most financially successful James Bond film of all time, Skyfall, which, of course, turned out to be Spectre. Now, when Skyfall opened in November of 2012, it was a much, much bigger hit than anyone involved with the series ever could have realistically hoped for. It made $1.1 billion, which for comparison's sake, is twice what its predecessor Quantum of Solace made. There were a lot of reasons why Skyfall was so big, but one without a doubt was the fact that a four-year interval between films no doubt made James Bond's return to the big screen a monumental event, so right there interest was higher than usual for a Bond movie. Add to that the theme song by Adele, which was everywhere at the time, and the fact that director Sam Mendes really did go out and deliver one hell of a good James Bond movie, and you have a recipe for a series-changing blockbuster. But when it came to making Spectre, it seemed like everyone had one goal in mind, make another Skyfall. Now, this is probably where things went wrong as the movie eventually ended up opening to a rather cool reception by fans. It was still a financial success, not as big as Skyfall, but notably bigger than either Casino Royale or Quantum of Solace. Sam Mendes returned and was actually the first director since John Glenn back in the 80s to make more than one James Bond film back to back. Of course, Martin Campbell had made two James Bond movies, but he had several outings that he sat out between them. And I think maybe that's the key to be a really good James Bond director. I think sometimes you do really need to take a breather because these movies take a lot out of a director. I mean, just think about it. Think of what must go into making a James Bond movie. Can't help but think it would be super exhausting, right? Especially for a director like Sam Mendes, who probably wasn't used to the logistical challenge of making a big action movie like this. When you watch Skyfall, you really get the sense that the director, in this case Mendes, is putting literally everything he has up there on the screen. It doesn't feel like this is setting up a big franchise. It feels like he was trying to make the definitive James Bond movie. Whether or not he was successful or not is really up to the average viewer. I don't know if I would say it was a definitive James Bond movie, but it certainly was a very successful James Bond movie. But I think by the time it was over, he was kind of done, right? But of course, it was so financially successful, there was never any doubt that they were going to bring Sam Mendes back, and he was enticed to come back and do Spectre, which I think in hindsight might have been a mistake. Apparently a few other directors were approached with Nicholas Winding Refn actually apparently having been approached at some point or so he says. A Nick Reffin James Bond movie probably would have been really weird to be honest. However, we didn't get Reffin. We got Mendes, and Mendes really did try to make Spectre amazing. And there are some technical aspects of the movie that are absolutely brilliant. For instance, there's the teaser of the movie, which takes place in Mexico City on Day of the Dead. And I feel like Mendes probably came back to do the movie just to do this sequence because there's this long, unbroken take that goes on forever and ever. And if you've seen his follow-up movie, 1917, it feels like this was a dry run for what he hoped to accomplish with that film. And you know what? If Spectre being kind of a mediocre James Bond movie got us the all-out masterpiece that is 1917, I'm kind of happy he came back and made Spectre. Spectre, right? I mean, it's a great, great movie, 1917. And Spectre, well, not great, has definitely some moments. And this opening scene, which ends with this massive helicopter battle, is pretty insane, right? And I also love James Bond's Day of the Dead costume. It's pretty cool. And I think it shows off the cinematography by Hotier Van Hotayama pretty well. Now, of course, everybody was very disappointed that Roger Deakins didn't come back, but he had already done his James Bond movie. I think what happened was Deakins basically went by the lesson that I think many Mendes didn't learn was that he had put all the ideas that he had into a James Bond movie into Skyfall and didn't really have anything left over for Spectre, so he stepped out. And Van Hotema does actually, I think, a pretty good job, but a lot of people did criticize the photography when the film came out because it does look distinctly different than Skyfall. But no matter. Now, one of the things that's notable about this movie is that it had a really tortured production. And in fact, you can read all about it because unfortunately, Skyfall coincided with the Sony leak. Yeah, that's right. Back when the Sony servers were hacked before the interview came out, tons of information came out about Spectre, about the fact that the budget was completely completely insane, about some haggling between Sony and Eon and MGM, and basically the fact that the budget for this movie ended up being somewhere between 240 to 300 million dollars, which is just absolutely astounding. 
By comparison, Skyfall's rumored budget is only between 150 to 200 million dollars. They really, really put a lot of money into this film, but I think it was kind of all for naught because creatively, they just didn't have the same stuff that they did in Skyfall. Now, that's not to say they didn't try. Neil Purvis and Robert Wade, of course, were back to write the script, but they had an assist by John Logan and Jez Butterworth. Now, the intention with this movie was to bring all the previous installments in the Daniel Craig canon together and relate them all to that classic criminal organization that they hadn't been able to use since Diamonds Are Forever, officially at least, Spectre, Special Executive for Counterintelligence, Terrorism, Revenge, and Extortion. Now, I've gone into it in other episodes why they couldn't actually use Spectre, and it was due to some legal rights haggling with Kevin McClory, but by the time Spectre came out, all that had been resolved, and it was time to bring back Ernst Stavro Blofeld. Of course, they didn't tell anybody this when the movie was being made. No, no, they were all pretending that Christoph Waltz, who was cast in the role, was going to be playing a guy named Franz Oberhauser. They wanted it to be a big surprise, which is kind of like when they cast Benedict Cumberbatch's Khan in Star Trek Into Darkness. I think that when people actually realized that he was playing Blofeld, they were kind of disappointed, right? Because they didn't build up the character at all. They made you think that he was this other guy, and then, oh, he's Blofeld after all, who's this iconic character it doesn't really make any sense and he's got hair i mean i'm sure they're gonna make him lose the hair at some point whatever but uh, i don't know he didn't seem like blofeld to me that's for sure anyway they really try to draw together the events of the other films by saying that mr white and silva and all the villains le Chiff, and all the bad guys that he's faced up to now were all working under the umbrella of an organization which turns out to have been specter it was all me james it's always been me the author of all your pain. But I never really understood why they felt the need to really always kind of make it seem like Daniel Craig was fighting one enemy in all of these movies. Skyfall kind of did away with that, and I think that it really worked in that regards because it allowed them to tell a pretty simple and emotional story, which in the end was all anchored by the affection that 007 had for M. Here, M is more or less gone, but they still can't resist bringing Judi Dench back for a cameo by having her show up in a video recording, which I felt kind of cheesy to be honest, because we have a perfectly good M now, who's of course played by Ray Fiennes. The premise, of course, is that MI6 is under bureaucratic attack by a new character named C, who I think that Ray Fiennes actually is one of the best lines in the movie where he says, you, you, I know exactly what C stands for. And I thought he was going to say, you know which word, but then he said something else. And now we know what C stands for. Careless. Uh, but yeah, he plays C, who wants to shut down MI6 and wants to install this new intelligence initiative called Nine Eyes. Of course, Bond isn't really involved in this. He's off chasing that mysterious terrorist organization that he was clued into in the teaser that, of course, is Spectre. Along the way, he gets to sleep with Monica Bellucci's Lucia Sciara, the wife of the guy that he kills at the beginning of the movie, lucky him, and goes on to Austria, where he gets to meet Mr. White once again, and meets up with Dr. Madeline Swan, who we're supposed to believe is supposed to be James Bond's true love. But the problem is, as much as I like Lee Sidu, who plays plays the part, her chemistry with Daniel Craig isn't that great because they really don't give her a lot of time to build a relationship with Bond. They're barely together for any time at all before we're supposed to believe that they're kind of in love. It's not like his relationship with Eva Green's Vesper Lind was in the other film where it kind of slowly grew over the course of the film and he had room to breathe. There's too much action and too much going on in this movie for you ever to believe that they could even have a personal connection beyond just a purely physical one. Anyway, so let's break the movie down. Daniel Craig I think still does a great job as James Bond in this movie. I think physically this must have been an even more punishing movie than Skyfall because he's doing some pretty insane stunts and it was after this movie that he kind of told the people that he'd rather slit his wrist than come back and do another James Bond movie. Of course he wasn't serious because he did come back with no time to die but I think this was a really tough shoot for him. His physical performance in this is great, and he's a really good James Bond at this point. Maybe not quite as sharp as he was in Skyfall, just because he doesn't have the material, but I digress. He's very good, so I give him an 8. As far as the Bond ladies go, I'm thrilled that Monica Bellucci finally got to be a James Bond girl, but she's barely in it. She has one brief love scene with Daniel Craig where you don't really see much, and it's fine. I'm glad that she's in there, and I'm glad that you get to say that Monica Bellucci at some point in her life was a James Bond girl. But the main Bond girl in this is Lee Sidhu as Madeline Swan, who's actually the daughter of Mr. White. I never really bought that she was his daughter. I didn't really get that connection and why they brought that into the movie. It felt kind of convoluted. Again, I think Leah Sidhu is an amazing 
amazing actress. I just didn't really buy the character, but I'm very curious to see what they do with her in No Time to Die, because I know that she's back and I know Christoph Waltz is back, and I'm curious to see if that movie kind of redeems Spectre somewhat. Naomi Harris also is back in a much smaller role this time as Ms. Moneypenny. So the Bond girls in this one are a mixed bag for me. I'd say probably a six on 10, just because Madeline Swan, who's the main Bond girl, doesn't really feel like the next love of James Bond's life, like we're supposed to believe she is. Villains here are a real disappointment though. I was expecting Christoph Waltz to be an amazing Blofeld. Even though they were calling him Franz Oberhauser, I still knew that he was Blofeld because I had read some of the Sony leak. And I thought that Waltz was gonna really pull it off, but I think they went the path of least resistance. I think they chose an actor that was too obvious a choice for the role. I mean, Christoph Waltz by this point has played so many villains, right? It's it's kind of boring when you cast him in a villainous role. I think Christoph Waltz is actually kind of better in heroic roles like he was in Alita Battle Angel. Playing a bad guy just seems old hat for him, and I think he's kind of boring as Blofeld, although of course they are bringing him back in the next movie. I don't know to what extent, but uh, I was very disappointed by his performance. I think the only one with real menace in this movie is Dave Bautista as Mr. Hinks, who Spectre's top assassin and only has one line of dialogue, although it's a great line of dialogue. Physically, he's a real match for Daniel Craig and is actually bigger than him, and I think that uh, in some ways, Dave Bautista might have made a better Blofeld. Just make him a really tough, totally reimagined Blofeld. Bautista's got a lot of depth. You know, still waters run deep. I think he would have been great. But, you know, they just make him the muscle-bound henchman, and that's disappointing. I give the villains in this one a very disappointing 5 on 10. The gadgets, there's not too much here. Ben Wishaw is back as Q, and you get to see James Bond's Aston Martin DB10. Otherwise, though, not a huge role for Q, except that he gets to clue Bond in on some, some information involving Spectre, but not a great role for him at all, I didn't think. So gadgets in this movie get like about a two or a three on 10, although it's a great car, I have to say. It is a really great car. The score by Thomas Newman is actually not as sharp as it was in Skyfall. I really liked what he did for the saga in that film. I thought he brought some interesting themes into the James Bond universe, but in Spectre, I felt he was kind of doing the same thing that he had done in Skyfall. And I really didn't care for the pop theme song by Sam Smith, which was, again, everywhere when this came out in 2015. They were trying to make this the next Skyfall breakout smash, and in fact, did win an Academy Award, although I thought it didn't deserve to win the Academy Award, and it was a song that kind of annoyed me. So I give the music in this a very disappointing five out of 10. As for the movie itself, a lot of people have said that this is one of the worst James Bond movies ever, but I really don't agree at all. I think people are really mistaken when they say that. I think the problem with Spectre is that it's just not Skyfall. There are things about it that are great, and I think that if it had come out in between Quantum of Solace and Skyfall, I think people probably would have loved Spectre because it's so much better than Quantum of Solace is. There's a lot of really good action. There's that amazing teaser. Um, there's some really good photography, and there's some really good action sequences, but it just doesn't really kind of come together as a film. I remember when this came out, I gave it about a 7 on 10, which I think was probably just too generous because I love James Bond movies so much. In hindsight, I have to give it a 6 on 10. I don't think it's terrible, but then again, I don't think a lot of James Bond movies are terrible. I don't think Quantum of Solace is terrible. I think Quantum of Solace is pretty good, but I think Spectre and Quantum of Solace are kind of on the same level in that way. Neither movie is terrible, but they're just not as good as they should be. That said, financially, it was a pretty big hit. A lot of people seem to think that it was kind of a flop just because it didn't gross as much money as Skyfall did, but it still made $880 million worldwide. And that is probably the second highest grossing James Bond movie of all time after Skyfall. And it was notably bigger than either Casino Royale or Quantum of Solace. So while it wasn't the size of a hit that Skyfall was, Spectre was still a very successful movie. Now, I think that Spectre is one of those movies that might be better in hindsight once we finally get to see No Time to Die, because apparently it does pick up on a lot of the threads left by Spectre. So I'm waiting to see. I'd love to do another James Bond revisited of Spectre, maybe take two a couple years from now where I go back and I say, oh, you know what? Spectre was actually amazing because it was just dropping us all these hints for what was to come in No Time to Die. So, we're pretty much all caught up with the franchise now. All that remains is No Time to Die, which opens on October 8th. But we're not quite done with James Bond Revisited. Oh no, we've counted down all the James Bond movies and we revisited all the James Bond movies, but now the time has come to rank our favorite James Bond movies, our favorite James Bond villains, our favorite James Bond girls, gadgets, and more. So join us next time for our first ever official James Bond Revisited ranking, the 10 best James Bond villains of all time. Coming soon to Joe Blow Videos.
If you like this video and you like the James Bond Revisited series, make sure to click on the bell to receive notifications every time we post a new video. We're an independent company, and you know what? We appreciate all of your support.